Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers. I'd like to welcome you to session six of the third day in the Revisions Festival. Through lectures, discussions, and workshops, we've been focusing on the ways in which technological bias shapes our cultural realities. City Lights, together with Goethe Institute San Francisco and Gray Area, have brought together a network of activists, educators, critical theorists, designers, and programmers to share new perspectives and develop new visions advocating for justice and reclaiming power. City Lights is greatly honored to be working alongside Goethe Institute and Gray Area and helping bring you this remarkable program. Goethe Institute San Francisco is the cultural arm of the Federal Republic of Germany. Their programs encourage intercultural dialogue and enable cultural involvement. They aim to strengthen the development of structures in civil society and foster worldwide mobility. It is a great pleasure to be working once again with Bettina Wodianka and her colleagues in bringing you this exciting program. The festival is part of the project called Image in Bias, which originated with Bettina and her colleagues, and that critically engages with the cultural realities being increasingly determined by imperceptible technologies. I'd also like to extend our gratitude to our friends at Gray Area, another partner in crime in the production of this festival. They are the perfect medium where something like revisions can flourish. Gray Area is a cultural center and educational hub located in San Francisco's Mission District. Their mission is to apply art and technology to create social and civic impact through education, incubation, and public events. They use digital tools to create art and design projects that benefit society. I'd like to take this moment to thank Nadav Hockman and his amazing team at Gray Area for all their good work. A big shout out to Matthew Chacon, who's been our tech wizard throughout the festival, making sure that everything runs smoothly behind the scenes. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with them in the past, and City Lights is honored and thrilled to be working with Gray Area on this really fantastic project. So the session today is called You Are Here, a Field Guide, and it is being presented by Ryan Milner and Whitney Phillips. Ryan Milner is Associate Professor of Communication at the College of Charleston and author of The World Made Meme, Public Conversations and Participatory Media, out from MIT Press. Whitney Phillips is Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies at Syracuse University and the author of This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things, Remapping the Relationship Between Online Trolling and Mainstream Culture, also produced by MIT Press. Together, they are the co-authors of a new book, which mirrors the title of today's talk. It's called You Are Here, A Field Guide for Navigating Polarized Speech, Conspiracy Theories, and Our Polluted Media Landscape, published by the wonderful MIT Press once again. So we will be posting links in the chat function with which you may purchase the book, uh, as well as uh, several of their other books. Um, the presentation will be followed by a Q&A, so please post your questions and comments in the Q&A function of your dashboard. So. Ryan Milner, Whitney Phillips, welcome to the festival. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, your current book is so very much aligned with the mission of revision. So we're really so glad you could really be part of this. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Yeah, Happy we're delighted. Talk. So I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna take it away. Okay. Do we see it? Are we good? I see it. Excellent. So, we're really, really glad to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for joining us for this conversation. So the, talk, the focus of the talk today is gonna to be twofold. Um, in the first part, we're gonna be discussing a series of ecological metaphors, which were, we've developed as teaching tools to help readers understand how they personally fit within online environments, identify and push back against toxic disinformation and, and encourage ethical action. And we bundle these goals under the idea of ecological literacy, which we will fully define in just a minute. The second part of our talk is going to apply these metaphors to a specific case study. We're gonna look at how a basic failure to think ecologically about the funny jokes, the memes, the lulls of early internet culture, which means something really, really specific that we'll be defining fully in a moment too, how that internet culture helped white nationalists and other reactionaries in 2016 breeze into the public square under the guise of just trolling to great consequence as we know. We won't just tell the story and leave it at that though. Drawing from this case will also reflect on some questions. How should we make sense of these kinds of information failures? How can an ecological approach to information to our online participation help us now and in the future? 
the metaphors and the case study that we're going to be discussing here today are taken from our latest book, You Are Here, which you have heard about, and we are happy to give you a bit of the content of that book today. So in a nutshell, You Are Here tells the story of the Trump era. So a primary focus then, of course, is what happened during the Trump era from 2016 to 2020. So for example, it's contextualizing the years long emergence of conspiracy theories like QAnon and the deep state and how those energies exacerbated the COVID crisis. But beyond merely saying what happened during Trump's presidency, the book is exploring how we got a President Trump, what energies had been percolating for years, and in some cases, decades, before the 2016 election cycle. Besides asking that uh, what and why of the Trump years, Your Here is also a book about media literacy. Uh, but it's a particular kind of media literacy, a media literacy that emerges from a communitarian ethic. So communitarianism is an ethical paradigm, an ethical framework that foregrounds reciprocity, interdependence, our shared responsibility within our groups. It, as a paradigm, contrasts to the individualistic focus of liberalism. Liberal in the sense of liberalism here isn't referring to being politically progressive or morally permissive as the terms often used in contemporary US politics. Instead, when we're talking about liberalism here, we're talking about a political philosophy that extends back to the enlightenment, the scientific revolutions of the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe. Liberalism, this political philosophy, uh, is claimed in a lot of different combinations by a broad range of political perspectives within the US. That's what kind of makes it confusing to talk about sometimes. Liberalism enshrines individual freedoms, like the freedom of, the spe of speech, the free press, property rights, civil liberties. Uh, liberalism strongly informs libertarianism, which puts a particular emphasis on personal autonomy as a political philosophy and ethic, as well as neoliberalism, uh, which is a political philosophy and ethic that puts a particular emphasis on free market capitalism, the marketplace of ideas in the actual marketplace as well. And so whatever combination it appears, liberalism is focused broadly on protecting what are called the negative freedoms of individual people. Freedoms that are negative in the sense that they're freedoms from outside encroachment. Basically, I don't want the government, I don't want any institution, I don't want you telling me what to do. I am free from your intervention. It's a ruggedly individualistic philosophy in that way. It's profoundly tangled up in US American mythology. mythology. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, manifest destiny. Uh, we're steeped in this kind of classical liberalism in our educations of American civics, politics, our socialization. Communitarianism as a political philosophy and an ethic, on the other hand, is concerned with a different type of freedom. It's still concerned with freedoms, but it's focused on what are called positive freedoms. So instead of freedom from encroachment, it's freedoms for diverse members of the group to enjoy equally. Uh, flourishing in this sense is seen as a collective goal, not a solely individualistic goal. So you can see how this difference, or you can see this difference in how free speech debates are often framed. And here we're talking about more colloquial discussions of free speech as they happen in online platforms uh, and less kind of specifically legal ones. A liberalistic approach to free speech starts from a place of it's the individual's right to say what they want. If what they say is poisonous, if what they say is terrible, that's a side effect of an open society. That's the cost of doing business in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, the response to this terrible toxic speech should be more speech, not enforced silence. It should be the good ideas outweighing the bad ideas in that crowded, noisy, cacophonous marketplace of ideas. That's the liberalistic understanding of free speech that we get in so many conversations about online platforms, platform moderation, those kind of things. A communitarian approach, on the other hand, um, says that it's the collective's rights not to be poisoned by toxic speech in the first place. That instead we need to cultivate an approach to speech that ensures that the most people are safe and empowered to speak because there are specific people who are very much bullied out of that marketplace of ideas if we're not looking out for everyone. And so this distinction between communitarianism and liberalism between these different understandings of freedom of speech, it isn't an aside, it's critical to underscore uh, that when we critique ideals around freedom in this talk, and we'll talk a lot about freedom of speech and where it goes wrong, uh, we're referring to a specific expression of freedom of speech, a zoomed in individualistic approach to freedom rather than 
the more collective understanding of freedom that we advocate for in You Are Here. So take all that together, combine media literacy with communitarianism, and you get what we call in the book ecological literacy as a framework for approaching how we participate online. Ecological literacy is like media literacy um, in the ways that you might be familiar with in that it presents a set of best practices for navigating an increasingly complicated, increasingly distressing, uh, at least for us over the last few years, uh, digital media environment. But our take on media literacy, our understanding of ecological literacy is unique in that it focuses intently on communitarian hallmarks, that reciprocity, that interdependence, that shared responsibility that we have for each other, as opposed to me first, don't tell me what to do individualism. The metaphors that we explore in You Are Here embody this communitarian spirit. And what we seek to cultivate as we talk through participation online is a safer and a more inclusive and more joyful, we hope in the end, online space for everyone. So that's the foundation of what we'll be talking about today. So let's get right into the metaphors. So the very first to cover is polluted information. And we use that instead of mis or disinformation. Now, generally, when people talk about false stories online, those are the words that they use. They talk about misinformation or they talk about disinformation. And, and the distinction between these two concepts is really important. Misinformation is false information spread on accident, while disinformation is false information that's spread on purpose. So that matters. That distinction is important. And at the same time, it kind of doesn't matter the information still ends up spreading regardless of the poster's intentions, whether it's on accident or it's purposeful. And, and something that starts out as one thing, if it starts out as misinformation, can transform into disinformation depending on who ends up sharing it and, and vice versa. So because of that, it's often not possible to tell which is which, whether you're looking at miss or dis just by looking. And that makes it very difficult to know what the best response would be. So if a person is doing something with good intentions on accident, you would wanna intervene in a very different way than if someone is doing something with bad intentions on purpose. Polluted information totally sidesteps that problem. It does not care about motives. And it does a lot more than that too. So the first thing it does is that it highlights the broader environmental consequences of networked information and, and directs attention to the various downstream consequences of that information. So in the natural world, an example uh, would be an oil spill. So oil spills are never confined to the specific location of the spill. That's a problem and you have to deal with that. But the consequences are widespread and reverberate throughout the environment. And, and that's the kind of zoomed out view that polluted information encourages us to take. It's not just the polluted thing. It's not just the false story. It's all the other places that story goes and all the things that brought that story to our doorsteps, proverbially or literally, depending. Um, polluted information also zeroes in on the environmental justice elements of this conversation, namely how harm online is unequally distributed across groups. With black and brown, and indigenous communities so much more likely to be poisoned where they live, work, and play, just, just like they are offline. So finally, in addition to those things, polluted information allows us to more thoughtfully consider how we all can pollute simply by going about our day-to-day -day lives. Because it's not just the industrial polluters or the people who actively set out to pollute that can have an enormous impact on the landscape. And we're gonna be giving a case study that describes how that happens in a bit. So the polluted information metaphor, it suffuses the entire book. Um, and it also is central to the book's other main metaphors, which are root systems, land cultivation, and hurricanes. So let's talk about redwood root systems. So the redwood root system metaphor, uh, which we used to talk about the spread of pollution uh, from different uh, places online to other places. It is a metaphor that highlights how information introduced on one side of a grove in one platform, in one group chat, in one place can swiftly filter out, feeding into surrounding groves, other platforms, other group chats, other channels, and groves beyond that. This metaphor reminds us that we have to be extremely careful about what we're adding to our own networks, our own social media platforms, our own uh, places where we're talking with friends, because that information can travel in highly unpredictable ways. 
The redwood roots metaphor also reminds us that pollution doesn't magically appear online. When something toxic enters the root system in nature, it's because it's been filtered in by various ecological processes, and then it quickly spreads through the forest's many interconnections. Polluted information online doesn't magically appear either. It's filtered in by a range of online dynamics, and then it quickly spreads through the network's many interconnections. Online and off, once pollution is present, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. The ideal ecological takeaway of this metaphor when we are thinking about applying these lessons to our life is that when you reflect on how connected everything is, how fast information can travel online from one point to the next, you're more likely to pause before you share. You're more likely to consider how to harness the dynamics of digital media responsibly instead of allowing yourself to be used by them. So the second metaphor is land cultivation. And applied to online spaces, land cultivation highlights how we influence our networks in big and small positive and negative ways, sometimes just by being in them. And this is true whether we're an influencer or a cultural figure, and so in that case our land would be more like a large factory farm, or if we're just a sort of everyday person with a small follower count, in which case the land would be more like a small garden. You know, it, regardless of what we're trying to do, we impact the spaces that we occupy. And the land cultivation metaphor also reminds us that when it comes to the spread of polluted information, mo motives matter so much less than outcomes. Offline, people with the absolute best intentions and the worst intentions can harm the land equally. And the same is true on social media. Those who actively try to confuse or manipulate or harm other people have an obvious environmental impact. They're mass polluters. Less obvious, but no less serious, is the cumulative effect of the pollution everyday people introduce into the environment without even trying. And searching for the source of this sort of lower level everyday pollution doesn't necessarily mean searching for villains. It means highlighting effects and identifying causes, especially when that cause just so happens to be you. And the ideal uh, ecological takeaway here is this. So looking around at our own farmland helps us identify what we personally are contributing to our networks. And this encourages us to develop strategies for growing the healthiest crops for all the other people around us who need the land as much as we do. The third metaphor we use to talk about pollution spread online is hurricanes. When applied to online spaces, uh, this hurricane metaphor reflects the fact that no controversy online is self-contained. No conspiracy theory, no bit of misinformation traveling across and between networks. Like hurricanes in nature, online hurricanes are fed by all kinds of energies. Uh, this metaphor reminds us that we can't separate out any one piece of a story, any one piece of a conspiracy theory. We have to consider all the interconnected elements that fuel the controversy forward. Regarding polluted information, the hurricane metaphor also reminds us that there's more to a storm than the storm itself. Hurricanes in nature can be enormously destructive, but often it's not the hurricane itself that does the worst damage. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. We get a lot of hurricanes, and I know this all too well. The storm is one thing, but the storm surge is, can be cluttered with debris. Um, rivers can flood with toxins. Water supplies can be contaminated with sewage. All downstream effects that can have environmental consequences when the storm itself has gone away. This allows hurricanes to spread pollution unexpectedly. In the same way, online controversies, online conspiracy theories, online misinformation, disinformation, uh, they've got many chances for pollution to be sucked into their storms, uh, just like a false rumor shared by neighbors. Structures within the online environment, algorithms, for instance, can also cause pollution to flow when storms make landfall. So the ideal ecological takeaway here is that we, when we consider the elements fueling a storm forward, we're better able to predict what's likely to make things worse. We can also try to contain the pollution that might be sucked up or generated by a storm rather than blasting it back into the hurricane's eye. So these four metaphors, they give us a way to talk about overwhelming problems in a more concrete way. But more than that, what we hope is that they inspire readers to reflect on their own experiences and actions online. And that is the you in You Are Here. We want readers to think about where they fit in the information ecosystem, even, maybe even especially, if they don't see themselves as an industrial polluter. They're not a conspiracy theorist. They're not actively sowing disinformation. They're not Donald Trump. 
even if you are none of these things, you exist within a shared, fundamentally interdependent environment. And we wanted to help people better think about it in those terms to better equip them to navigate through the sludge. So how have you been engulfed by the storm? How have you um, been engulfed in pollution? And so the metaphors we use are a heuristic in this way. They're tools designed to help people think of a problem and possible solutions differently. And they're also designed to help nudge readers away from self-focused individualism and toward a more communitarian ethic. And that brings us to practice what we preach time, which we also hope will help you reflect on how you might fit within the very upsetting story, series of stories we're about to tell. And, and this is a story about how toxins in the form of white nationalism and supremacy were able to flow so freely through digital networks, through trolling and internet culture, straight into the taproot of US politics. And to do that, we first have to reflect on what kinds of forests were developed for, by whom and for whom well before any of the 2016 narrative was set in motion. And returning to the recurring theme of this event, which is that none of our technologies are neutral. And in this case, we have the forest we have because liberalism's freedom from one, to put it very bluntly. So online, liberalism is most clearly articulated through the maxim that internet or that information wants to be free. This idea was foundational to the computer revolution of, of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And this sentiment reflects liberalism's staunch defense of, as previously discussed, negative personal freedom. So freedom from external restriction. I ideals about freedom, especially negative freedoms, were central to how early online spaces were built. They were so central to what many of and they were also central to what many of its early boosters sort of celebrated about it. So online, you got to be free, and it was your right to be free. And John Perry Barlow's massively influential 1996 essay, Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, pretty much says it all, as it explicitly is drawing from the flowery language of liberalism woven throughout the United States Declaration of Independence. So this idea that information wants to be free is animated by an underlying assumption that more information is always better. Information can be a very good thing, of course. Science depends on information, and so do all forms of learning. That should go without saying. Within the digital forest, however, the belief that more information is always and necessarily and unquestionably better than less information and that efforts to limit how information spreads is always and necessarily and unquestionably bad has caused some major problems. Because so much of the information that's been allowed to spread or even encouraged to spread has intractably polluted the landscape, has made life and relationships and politics worse, meaner and stupider and more dangerous for some, which loops us back to the idea of environmental justice. So to recap, uh, Pete, folks from Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities are much more likely to be poisoned where they live, work, and play. Offline and online, that means having to navigate the constant crushing presence of environmental toxins. Information, particularly online, is the carrier of those toxins or one source of those toxins. So hence, information isn't always going to be necessarily and unquestionably good to the people it can and does and will continue to harm. More information, won't always and necessarily and unquestionably be better when historically it's been used to threaten and dehumanize your community. But these weren't the experiences or the perspectives that social media decision makers built into their platforms. Instead, when the largest platforms were created, people in positions of power had a pretty explicitly positive relationship with information. And that's not surprising, as mostly white dudes, they weren't likely to be harmed by information, certainly not in the same kinds of patterned ways of, of, of toxicity that women and racial minorities and other minoritized groups have always needed to navigate. So because their relationship with information was generally a big thumbs up, these decision makers' main worry wasn't about how to slow information down when marginalized communities were threatened. It was instead to figure out how to speed information up across the platform to, to help information scale. 
But before anybody starts tweeting about how we hate free speech or are saying that Facebook has never moderated anything or even that Facebook has never censored anyone because Facebook has done all of those things, we need to return to some of the needle threading from earlier where we drew a line between freedom centered on the individual and freedom centered on the collective. So then and now, site administrators would do something if someone posted something really terrible or illegal, or at least they would try their best. And, and there's a whole other conversation here too about how inconsistent moderation rules have been on these platforms, resulting in sometimes pretty grotesque over moderation of arguably harmless or even critically important content and under moderation of much more obviously harmful content. So still though, when representatives of these companies have spoken about free speech and made critical decisions about free speech, freedoms have largely been framed in the negative in the sense of freedoms from. Especially in the early days, free speech on these sites meant that you were free from having your speech policed too much. That's what creates an open society. And that's exactly what YouTube CEO Steven, Susan Wojcicki argued in a letter to content creators in late August of 2019. She was defending YouTube's choice to allow, quote, offensive content, including conspiracy theories, to remain on the site on the grounds that, quote, ultimately, it makes us a stronger and more informed society. OK, also, quick aside for context. Well, Checky sent this letter a few weeks after the El Paso mass shooting that left 23 pe people dead, most of whom were Mexican or Mexican American. And that prompted a roar of radicalization, a roar of discussion about and concern over online radicalization, including the role that, that social platforms play in that radicalization. And this is where some worlds start to uncomfortably collide. So in this particular shooting, the shooter posted his white supremacist manifesto, which polled for the kind of racist conspiracy theories a person could easily find on sites like YouTube to 8chan before the shooting. And in response, Cloudflare dropped the site. So at least for a while, 8chan went dark. And, and, and in response to all of this, the House Homeland Security Committee responded to the attack and, and 8chan's role in the attack. Uh, or at least they wanted to, in to investigate what that role might have been. So they dragged Jim Watkins, the owner of, of HN, to testify about HN's role and about the relationship between hate speech and, and um, these kinds of shootings. And, and not a week after Wojciechowski's letter was published, Watkins made a very an eerily similar argument in this testimony to Congress about how important it was to allow, quote, offensive uh, perspectives on sites like 4chan, because doing so allows for what he described as better reason and enlightened wisdom. In other words, openness, ultimately, same thing, makes us a stronger and more informed society. And on paper, these kinds of calls for an open society the, in which it's incumbent on all of us to tolerate offensive perspectives, I say that in scare quotes because oftentimes offensive is used to describe explicitly dehumanizing, violent, terrorizing speech. So we're not just talking about something that like kind of hurts your feelings, but it threatens people. It, it puts people's lives in danger. So th the idea is that we need to tolerate this because we might learn something maybe and also that's just the cost of business that is what the marketplace of ideas is about you respond to it with more speech not less and and so sure i mean who doesn't again on paper want an open society even given the risks and beyond that who doesn't who wants to have their speech policed not 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 anybody that i know but what a focus on freedom from often overlooks is how it can actually minimize the freedoms for the collective as a whole, particularly by creating a circumstance in which marginalized people are further muted or threatened in their own efforts to speak freely. And this has absolutely been the result when Facebook has censored the Black Lives Matter activists or breastfeeding mothers or Palestinian activists during the Israeli strikes. Decisions that never made very much sense given their own moderation policies, but which certainly, certainly were not geared towards protecting the positive freedoms of the collective. So when people are so focused on freedoms from and at the same time are trying to speed up how fast information spreads, they also tend to overlook the fact that not all speech is treated equally on social sites and not all of it spreads equally. 
So they talk about the marketplace of ideas, but the marketplace is not, the marketplace of ideas is a power replication machine, not a truth telling machine. So there's already some problems in this assumption. And, and pollution that are, that, that's generated by people who are loudest and most unhinged because of all of these network dynamics are able to travel and in some cases are incentivized to travel much further than truthful speech or calm speech or corrections. And, and that's there's a whole range of network dynamics that, that ensures this outcome. You have an attention economy that rewards polluted information. You have, a, you know, again, a marketplace of ideas that does a terrible job filtering out polluted information. You have algorithms that do a great job recommending polluted information, which again, directly threatens the health of the collective, even if a few individuals end up benefiting greatly from such an arrangement. And it's critical to emphasize that the goal of social media decision makers was to create good networks, at least what counted as a good network, according to their own often uh, libertarian, always neoliberal ideals. The issue is that those who moved fast and broke things and who found increasingly ingenious ways to ensure that information wouldn't just be free but also profitable weren't basing their decisions on what toxins their social platforms might have filtered into the forest and what consequences might have been for the collective, particularly marginalized users. These toxins were always flowing. There were always warnings coming in from people who were being poisoned but those were not the voices that were being listened to. And, and when it's asked to assess Twitter's longstanding failures to curb abuse and harassment, for example, Twitter's co-founder, Ev Williams, basically admits as much. Had I been more aware of how people like me were being treated and or had I had a more diverse leadership team on board, he explains, we may have made it a priority sooner. Charlie Warzel, writing for, the, for BuzzFeed News at the time, further links Twitter's abiding commitment to free speech above all else with the homogeneity of the company's top decision makers. As one former employee told Warzel, the original sin is a homogenous leadership. This is part of what exacerbated the abuse problem for sure, because they were often tone deaf about the concern of users in the outside world, meaning women and people of color. So what Whitney just went through, um, the how and the why of uh, how our particular root system was created is the backdrop for everything else that we have to look at and understand when thinking about polluted information online, including a, the equally upsetting story that I'm about to tell as we talk through internet culture. Internet culture was able to pump toxins underground unchecked over a decade with catastrophic consequences running into the 2016 election. So by internet culture here, we're not referring to any old thing, any old person has ever created and put on the internet. We mean instead the cacophony of remixed jokes, jargons, folk, or, folk art, memes occurring on sites like Something Awful, 4chan, eventually Reddit and Tumblr. After that, pockets of Twitter, places on YouTube that coalesced in the late aughts and reached their peak popularity in the early 2010s. Basically, the internet culture bubbling up during the Obama years. This internet culture was, for its overwhelmingly white participants, a point of self-identification. They actively sorted themselves into a highly insular clique with a set of shared values, creating prolific content for this constellation of sites. These values included the belief that the internet was a corned off playpen from the real world, where memes were free and should be free to spread widely. And that if you didn't like something, you should just log off uh, because LOL, it's just the internet. Being able to do or make or mock something was justification enough for all that participatory fun. Even participants in this culture who had little sense of what liberalism was other than being broadly in favor of their own free speech drew from and reinforced the same centuries old liberal roots that informed why social platforms were built as they were. Everything that Whitney just walked through. Internet culture's emphasis on fun and funny negative freedoms, share that meme, troll that stranger, joke about Hitler because it's your rights, downplayed the destructive, anti-democratic, and deeply polluted dimensions of so many of the memes that swirled more on those terrible memes in a moment. Internet culture universalized its own whiteness and mostly maleness, and in the process totally overlooked and even outright silenced 
the perspectives of people who are not white or male. More on that in a moment too. The overlap between internet culture and the tech sector wasn't just ideological at this time. It was also interpersonal, linking employees of technology companies to meme enthusiasts, to tech savvy entertainment media, to marketers, to academics studying all of it. All of that composed what became known as and all police the boundaries of this internet culture. And that includes us, Whitney and I. Everything we critique others in this space of doing, we in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, were hundred percent guilty of ourselves. At the time we were graduate students. We both received our PhDs in 2012, me from the University of Kansas, uh, Whitney from Oregon. Uh, we both were studying elements of internet culture. I was looking at internet memes, Whitney was looking at online trolling. And as we participated in these sites, as we participated in these interpersonal networks, we shrugged at online harms because it was just trolling. We railed against any effort to limit the spread of memes because it was just edgy fun. And we reinforced white centrality by presuming that because uh, our white bodies were safe uh, from bigoted laughter, that there was no harm in laughing. I mean, anyway, didn't everybody already know that racism was wrong and stupid? We're all just satirizing it when we play with it online. Steeped in the culture of freedoms from internet culture, our own participation included, uh, developed a highly recognizable aesthetic that was inextricably linked with trolling on 4chan. You couldn't talk about one without talking about the other. Reflecting this relationship, internet culture embraced lulz, L-U-L-Z, and irony as an aspirational register. Lulz was a term popularized on 4chan used to label the emotional distress of a laughed at victim. Trolls claimed that lulz, eliciting this hilarious distress, was the only reason to do anything. As people who were there and partook, we can say without question that an enormous amount of internet culture content was genuinely fun and genuinely funny. But just beneath the surface of even the silliest memes, and often right there, not covered beneath anything at all, there was an undercurrent of toxicity. So many internet culture memes were flat out racist, straight up misogynistic. So many were dehumanizing of people who failed to adhere to the norms of white, typically male, typical middle classness which could simply mean not being white, male, or middle class. This was all couched in lulls, the knowing wink of just trolling on just the internet where nothing's real anyway, so have your fun, whatever it may look like. Obviously destructive, unabashedly dehumanizing trolls, taking active gleeful steps to harm others are easy to condemn. That's a no-brainer. But the internet cultural participants who howled with laughter in response to so many ironically racist and sexist jokes did the base, same basic thing as trolls. They disconnected their laughter from its consequences. For all the people daily poisoned by racism and misogyny, um, uh, were lost in this. Uh, the people laughing instead approached their targets, the targets of their amusement as just punchlines, as just pixels, as objects that never learned how to internet, never learned how to act right or look right. They did so because they could, because they were both willing and able to see lulls and all their fun instead of actual people as they were having that fun online. It should go without saying, the willingness and ability to disregard consequences and couch it all in irony, a trollish wink, is a luxury enjoyed only by people who also enjoy an excess of comfort and a lack of personal risk. For ironists and all the ways this kind of irony overlaps with whiteness, life is negative freedom. Don't tell me what to do. I'll be fine. Freedom to do and say what you please simply because it pleases you without ever having to pay any kind of a price for it. Why not laugh? Why not play? Nothing matters, at least not to you. Conversely, where there is suffering, where there's injustice, where bodies bear the scars of violence and dehumanization, there's no nihilistic trollish irony because there's no freedom. No freedom to go about your business unmolested, no freedom from the harms bearing down on your body. Uh, the only thing that's laughable in that case, is the idea that nothing matters. What internet culture participants didn't understand at the time, what we didn't understand at the time, what took us a lot of time to figure out, and we regret how long it took us to figure it out now, was just how dangerous, just how toxic this lulzy stance to the world really was. Groups who found themselves muted or targeted by so much disassociated laughter and all that streamlined sharing that carried it forth, 
could have foreseen the effects. They did foresee the effects. Those whose entire life got to be laughter would not have known to heed a chilling 2012 warning issued by New York Times writer Christy Wample. Speaking of the pervasiveness of irony she was seeing across popular culture in 2012, she noted that irony at these levels creates an ethical vacuum in the individual and collective psyche. Historically, Wample explained, vacuums eventually have to be filled by something, more often than not a hazardous something. 2012 is an important marker here. It's when the irony tinged jokes, memes, and overall aesthetic of internet culture, including many elements of trolling subculture, they went mainstream. This has happened for a variety of reasons, including the fact that the most prominent internet culture participants were on a fast track to success. Many attended some of the most prestigious universities in the world and after college accepted positions at some of the most prestigious media and tech companies in the world. Their voices and their jokes tangled ever more tightly with industry, even as everyday enthusiasts produced a dizzying stream of content in the same vein. The fact that the most prominent behind the scenes internet culture influencers were friends, or at least friends of friends or friends of friends of friends, who actively promoted one another's work across and between high profile platforms helped cohere that content and culture in all its lulzy, disassociated irony. It also helped that content and culture extend its roots even further underground. Suddenly in about 2012, trolling and meme merchandise showed up everywhere on television and movies and malls at Target and even on floats in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, a very famous Rickroll that happened then. In just a few short years, internet culture and all its implicit and explicit marginalizations, all its ironies, all its winking proclamations that LOL, nothing matters, have your fun, had become central to popular culture itself, at least within specific white middle-class circles. And all of that was spurred along by the idea that the more information there is, back to liberalism, the more memes people share, the more people comment, the better things are. And it's true, these things definitely are better, again, for some, uh, certainly for the titans of neoliberalism who found ways to monetize all those memes, all those comments, all those pixels. And so the pollution embedded within internet culture became more potent as it seeped through ever broadening swaths of the digital forest. The most obvious references to trolling subculture might have been minimized during these years or simply forgotten as that taproot fed into so many others. Still, even as the edge softened through those years, lulls became a dominant register, not just among extremely online influencers, but also among people who had no idea what forests they were even in, let alone how deep the roots went. The resulting chorus of ironic, nihilistic, fetishistic laughter created the perfect conditions for bigotry to spread stealthily tucked away within things that didn't seem polluted at all, that seemed instead just like harmless fun, just jokes, just memes on just the internet. This is just how it is here. As so many otherwise well-intentioned people watched, seeing nothing a lot of the time, white nationalists and supremacists giddily adopted the language and aesthetic of internet culture and its much meaner cousin, trolling. The mostly young, mostly white reporters at high profile national outlets and other tech publications who had been raised on internet culture and trolling were especially susceptible. They might have found white supremacists repulsive, but they had internalized the same norms and aesthetics the so-called alt-right at the time were weaponizing. As a result, so many of these young reporters, too many of them, assumed that the MAGA energy they were watching gather on 4chan and 8chan through 2015 and 2016 uh, was just trolling as usual, especially considering Trump was considered a real outside candidate for a lot of the time this energy was, was, was gathering, was beginning to emerge. They saw just the same edgy internet fun that they'd always known what to do with. And what they thought they should do with it in those early days was to make even more jokes about pro-Trump messages that featured things like swastikas and other violently racist statements, images, and symbols. Many didn't question if these neo-Nazis on the internet might be real neo-Nazis even as the threat became more pervasive. And all this poison continued to spread unfettered from this tree to that. It gathered more strength with each turn through Donald Trump's ascendancy, his eventual election, and then came the mayhem in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. This moment was a turning point. It, the extremely online trolling informed pro-Trump shit posters, as they were known, proved in this moment to be actual white supremacists carrying actual torches through the actual streets chanting actual Nazi slogans. For the first time, 
many of these reporters and many others as well began questioning the assumption that there was such a thing as just trolling on just the internet and that the mere act of repeating pro-Trump messages would make the, and the assumption that the act of repeating pro-Trump messages would make the messages disappear when people realized how stupid it all was. But by then, by 2017, by Charlottesville, it was too late. The poison had been percolating underground and it burst up through the sidewalk and up into the public square. And there's obviously a lot here. Um, and we've only skimmed the surface of what brought us to 2016, God help us all. But for the remainder of the talk, what we wanted to loop back to was the initial discussion of ecological metaphors. All four help us make sense of the toxicity tucked away in internet culture. And all four can help us think about how to avoid making the same kinds of mistakes. So we've already focused on redwood root systems, the network structures built by people, shaped by their assumptions for better and worse, mostly worse, that ensure that when pollution enters the taproot, it is very difficult to remove. The polluted information metaphor describes, of course, the ship that poisoned everyone, but it also highlights, again, the environmental justice elements of this discussion. So for instance, research published by in 2019 by Stop Online Violence Against Women, an inclusive public affairs initiative, underscores the consequences of the ironic fetishizing fun of internet culture. By 2012, 2012, Black women on social media were ringing the alarm bells about harassment campaigns that employed trolling tactics and internet culture aesthetics to demean and dehumanize Black women. Russian disinformation agents later replicated the same tactics and aesthetics to suppress the Black vote during the 2016 presidential election. In other words, here, harms, as they so often are, were disproportionately targeted against marginalized communities, particularly Black communities. The pollution levels kept rising and rising as the years went by, but because it was the Black and Brown folks, and especially Black women, whose safety and lives were being threatened, comfortable white folks were able to keep on lolling, keep on enjoying all of the mimetic fruits. So second, back to the hurricanes, or, back to the metaphors, hurricanes show us just how many overlapping energies were driving all that toxicity forward. What journalists covering the alt-right and big scare quotes did, what affordances amplifying memes and trolling and MAGA messages did, what everyday people responding to those journalists and memes and trolling and MAGA messages did, fed into and fed and was fed by all of the others. So finally, land cultivation helps show just how many people actually contributed to the mess that was 2016. The white nationalists and supremacists and broad spectrum bigots themselves played a major role. Of course, they're terrible. They actively strategically covered the landscape with as much toxicity as they possibly could. Recall Steve Bannon's famous strategy of quote, flooding the zone with shit. But other more well-meaning groups had an equally significant impact. They may not have meant to, but so many people tilled the land and sowed the seeds for bigots. Once that soil was primed and the winds began to blow, it was only a matter of time before the sky went dark. These metaphors help us understand what happened leading up to 2016 throughout those four long, long years and into the exciting present we're experiencing now of QAnon, the big lie. But what can they help us, uh, what can they help us with going forward? First of all, on a day-to-day -day basis, ecological literacy can help guide us to more ecologically informed behavior. When we're more aware of how we personally fit within the online environment, how we personally impact it and how it impacts us, we're more likely to see the cumulative downstream consequences of the things that we say and do online. Basically, we're more likely to be more careful about what we post and share and assume. Now, this is a bit tricky, though, because we're not suggesting here that cleaning up the online environment is as easy as individual behavior change. Uh, there are also industrial grade polluters out there whose entire business model is pumping out pollution and you create all kinds of environmental conditions for the out of control toxicity that we see all around us online today. What you do in your own social feeds won't change any of that. It would, of course, be so much easier if we could solve big problems with small behavioral changes. If that were possible, we'd just wag our fingers at everyone and say, be different, and we could all go back to our lives. Not only can we not do that, that kind of approach, it can be a trap. By suggesting that it's the individual's responsibility to solve problems created by big structural and institutional failures, basically letting the causes of the problems off the hook, 
this is the whole problem of trying to solve racism by convincing individual people to be less specifically racist. Individual people can be a real problem and it's better when they aren't racist, absolutely. But the root of the issue isn't your racist uncle. It's all the legal and economic and social structures that sustain white supremacy, so much so that your uncle thinks you're trying to cancel him if you merely point out the existence of white privilege. The same holds true for our dysfunctional online information ecosystem. Individual pollution absolutely accumulates and absolutely warrants our intervention. There are things we can all do that we all should do on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if we do happen to have a large platform with a big audience. And also, ultimately, our informational systems and technological infrastructures are the biggest problems we face. The underlying reason those systems are such big problems matters, and we believe points us towards change that can be meaningful and structural. Namely, this change is that our informational systems are not ecological enough in focus, and were never designed to be. They were designed from the beginning to be liberalistic. They were designed to be individualistic. They were designed to protect negative freedoms. What ecological literacy does then is help to cultivate over time a better understanding of reciprocity, interdependence, and shared responsibility within groups, a pattern of thoughts that we hope can be applied to other areas of life. This includes efforts to build new systems and fight back against the systems that have failed us historically and that have consistently muted, dehumanized, and uh, poisoned marginalized communities. Ecological thinking can help power the next generation of change to ensure that the freedoms we end up enshrining are those for the group to enjoy and benefit from and be protected by in equal measure. Thank you all so much. We can't wait to have a little bit of Q&A. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, well, I, I, as we're waiting for the questions to come in, I, I would like to ask one, who are some of your mentors and, and what is some of the core, you know, philosophy and, and, and some of the thinkers that have like influenced your work? I mean, I'm sure there's like activists out there that want to actually delve deeper after they've read your book um, into, you know, who some of the, you know, kind of the deeper kind of source materials, you know, were influenced by. That's a fascinating That's question. A really we've, never, question. We've, never we've never been asked, asked that, that question before, yeah. never once. We've been asked a lot of questions. I mean, so yeah. so are you asking in terms of the sort of theories that we've encountered or in right. individual, so theories, okay. Okay, yeah. Um, so I would, to jump in really quickly, one of the things that got me, that got us sort of spurred some of, some of these thoughts about um, how interconnected everything is, even though it didn't quite make its way into the book, um, was actually Bruno Latour and, and talking about actor network theory. And it mm -hmm. didn't end up in the book because we were really trying hard. It's a footnote. Um, but we <laughs> were trying really hard to write a book more on the trade side. And sometimes using dense academic theory can be alienating to readers. And because everyday people have so much to contribute to these conversations, it really seemed like it would be it would be uh, problematic in a lot of ways if we kind of kept people from wanting to engage because it's this like super dense theory. Not that somebody couldn't understand it if they, you know, took a course on it, mm -hmm. of course, but a lot of people haven't. And so we wanted to make sure that we were taking the spirit of that idea of verbing nouns and applying that to the kinds of things that took place online. And we did not take credit for any of the sort of actor network approach we did write a detailed uh, footnote. But again, we wanted to use a metaphor like hurricanes, which is sort of not arguing the same thing, but t drawing from similar kinds of interconnectedness and the fact that you never can look at something individually on its own. You've got to situate it within all the other stuff that causes it and then all the stuff that it ends up causing. So that was one that wasn't sort of a direct um, it wasn't directly sort of in the book. He's not a main character in the book, but the spirit of it is really sort of um, critical to what we were trying to, to do. And what would you, do you, do you have one, Ryan, that jumps out at you? Yeah, I think that as we went through, as we went through the process of, of figuring out the argument we were gonna make, we decided pretty early on that we had to approach the issue, not specifically talking about the technologies themselves, but talking about how the technologies were used to were, were built by people with ideologies, people with frames, mm -hmm. and then how people with ideologies and frames use these technologies. So we really um, 
took a strong turn to emphasizing that even when dealing with technological problems, we have to be thinking about people's worldviews, people's schemas, people's frames. And so there's a lot of scholarship from a lot of different traditions that talks about how people's frames of the world shape their understanding of the world. And one that really stands out to me is, uh, is Sandra Harding's standpoint theory. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that if you, I mean, it really, that is the subtext of a lot of the talk that, that we just gave, that if your standpoint is one that's a close proximity to power, you're less likely to see the consequences of that power on people who are more marginalized. Whereas if your standpoint is very far away from power, then you're going to have a wider scro scope of seeing the injustices that are happening and that kind of thing. And so lines of thinking that emphasize not just fixing technological problems with technological solutions, but instead thinking about the people who create technologies and then how our ideologies suffuse into our understanding of things like the truth and what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, that kind of, that is the, the underlying kind of philosophical spirit, spirit of the book. Yeah, and as you mentioned that, it's such a great question. I'm now yeah, I my loved it. mind I loved is it. whirling because I'm sort of, but the, um, I'm actually shocked no one's ever asked us that yeah, now I, liked I think it. about it. But, um, you know, so much of the book is informed by scholarship that has nothing to do with technology. Because mm -hmm. ultimately this book is not, I mean, it is about technology. We're talking about networks. We're engaging with literatures around, you know, algorithms and all of that stuff. Obviously we, we have to go there. But we're, we're talking about sort of broader cultural issues and broader cultural processes and much um, wider lens historical framing than just what happened during 2016, 2020. I mean, the first chapter of the book is on the satanic panics. And, and that was written, yeah. you know, a decade before um, even, I mean, a decade before Fox News, a lot of it um, sort of reflecting on what happened in the 80s and 90s, much of which was important, you know, going on in the 60s and 70s. And so the book is really sort of itself taking a zoomed out view. And that means not always focusing on and talking about technology in order to talk about technology. Yeah. Well, I know we have some activists in the audience and some people are already working in the field. And what would you suggest to them when it comes to networking with other activists, where can energy best be spent in terms of people combining efforts to kind of combat some, some of the things that we're, we're addressing here? like the sort of um, reactionary violence online sort of disinformation. I mean, so we can answer that question sort of in the negative that the there are some assumptions about what's going to help, that what's going to actually combat um, hate speech or falsehood more broadly. And, and from this sort of a, Kind of liberalistic tradition, a really, really common attitude, particularly within journalism, but it's pervasive within the US and the Western world more broadly, is the idea that light disinfects something. That if you just shine a light on something that's bad, that that is going to call people's attention to it. And then that in itself is going to have a corrective impact. And that absolutely can be the case. Certain audiences really benefit from those kinds of corrective endeavors. And at the very least, it can you know, signal a kind of solidarity. This is racist. This is bad. And there is absolute value in that. And that impulse and the sort of light shining effort is really easy, easily weaponized by um, extremists. And it also can end up having sort of unintended consequences. And so the, the advice that we would give activists, the advice that we give journalists, the advice that we give everyday folks is just because you assume that what you end up putting out in the world is going to have a certain impact on a certain audience, you have to allow for the possibility that unintended things are going to happen downstream. And even calling attention to, I mean, it is critical to call attention to injustice and to push back against it with all our might. Like that's absolutely critical. Also doing that at the same time can put a, a larger spotlight on an already marginalized or targeted individual or community. And so there are all these really sort of ambivalent nuances to think about and that that are harder to do when you're when you're kind of zoomed in and just thinking about the toxins in your hand. But when you zoom out and take a more ecological view, you're able to more strategically engage with and anticipate what those unintended downstream consequences could be so that you end up at the very least not accidentally spreading pollution on the behalf of the, the disinformation agent or the bigot that you're trying to subvert. And so there's just a lot, there are a lot of moving parts to consider and an ecological framework kind of helps you do that 
in a way that, that you can maybe not avoid all pollution, that might not be possible, but at least minimize what's possible to minimize. Um, so I have another question, this one, let's see. Could you both share a couple of your thoughts or maybe some concrete examples about how do you see internet culture, memes, tweets, social media platforms, aesthetics, shape or influence human's perception and interaction with mundane activities. And if you're interested to expand rather more traditional forms of art, um, they're thinking mm. painting, classical music, literature, sculpture. So I, 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 can, I can jump into this one because I happen to have a 13 year old daughter who has for the last year been heavy in the group chat scene with her and her friends. And it has been astonishing to me as somebody who just 10 years ago was kind of seeing these communicative norms and this register kind of emerge just to see how kind of internalized I feel like it has, it has become. Uh, that's just the, the way my daughter and my friends talk to each other in the group chat is very reminiscent of 4chan in 2008 with the kind of like barbed humor and the distance humor and you should have a veneer that nothing really, really gets to you as much and that the way you lose the game is by expressing some kind of earnest emotion, whether it's empathy or whether it is outrage or whatever. The, the way to win the group chat cool game is by being kind of ironic and detached and absurdist. And it's really interesting to see that register happen and to see my daughter show me, you know, memes and jokes that, that I get to be the, 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 the old man and go, and go, yeah, I've seen it all before. And so, so yeah, that kind of process really, really struck me because there was a while. So I was doing my dissertation research in 2012, looking at memes in this really kind of subcultural sense. And I figured that they were kind of on their way out, right? That other other fads would would take their place. And there was this kind of worry for a while in 2015 that this stuff wouldn't be relevant. Turns out the worry went the other way, that it would end up being super duper relevant. And instead it's swung this hard about face where it's kind of just, the register that a lot of people talk to uh, talk to each other in. And so I think that that can have some profound consequences. I think it's worth thinking about where where that leaves us, um, what we need to do to more thoughtfully communicate and and convey ideas. So there's a, a brief a brief interpersonal example of kind of some of that pervasiveness and where I see it kind of boiling out. Well, you know, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we have more questions coming in, but uh, I wanted to end with one last thing. What are the two of you going to be working on next? I'm just very curious because. Oh, yeah, we got a good one. This is a good question. We have a good one. Very yeah. excited. We are um, adapting You Are Here into a children's book. And we're about five sixths of the way through it, um, and so we've been drawing from some of Ryan's experiences because his his uh, daughter is the same sort of demo of the folks that we yeah. the young folks that we're going to be writing for. This is yeah, middle it's more grade. middle yeah middle mm -hmm. middle grades probably yeah. is more more accurate yeah yeah right. And so figuring out you know what what do we need to take from the adult book and what do we need to what needs to stay what needs to be expanded that has been a really sort of fascinating and difficult process but we have um one chapter to go and then the conclusion and then it's um it's a it's a written thing so you know hopefully we don't we don't know exactly what the timeline of that is going to be but it it really it's um thinking about these issues not just relevant in a political context because obviously of course they are but in a more interpersonal context and for younger people that's where the final discussion that we ended our talk today really focused on. It's not just about sort of teaching people to act better in their yeah. you know, group chats or online day to day. It's how can we cultivate a different habits of mind that yeah. can influence not just how people engage online, but offline too, to, to cultivate a more communitarian way of being in the world, to address the, the pressing issues that we're facing globally, um, not just around disinformation, but climate, for example. That's not going to happen if you don't cultivate a communitarian sort of way of being. So that's what we hope to do with the young ones. And so um, fingers crossed. Well, listen, thank you both. This is really vital work. You've done such a great service, especially to people who are just out there and completely in the dark about, you know, how we got to where we are. So 
thank you both so very much. This has been an amazing presentation. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in the room as well for joining us. Uh, we have more lined up, so please check out the calendar. Um, coming up hot on the heels of this session at 3 p.m., we have Jer Thorpe in conversation with Rami Ron Morrison. So please do check out that, register for that. Um, also like to remind everyone, we've posted links in the chat function with which you can buy You Are Here. Um, very, very excited about this book. Uh, we're featuring it at City Lights and uh, nice. you know, very, very important contribution, I think, to this area. Um, City Lights is now open for business. I'd like to let everyone know we're open 12 noon till 8 p.m. Uh, please come and join us. Uh, we do still require face covering. Um, but you know, we are following all the CDC guidelines and um, it'll be great to see you all. You can browse our stacks once again. Um, many, many events coming up. So, you know, please check out the City Lights website as well. Uh, today's talk is going to be rebroadcast on the Gray Area website. So in case you know of anyone who missed it or if you'd like to watch it again, you know, please do check that out. This event was sponsored by the City Lights Foundation. It's a 501c nonprofit carrying on the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti. The City Lights Foundation fosters an active engagement with books and literary culture. Our public events, publishing program, and educational outreach are dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So thank you all again for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Uh, Ryan, Whitney, be well. Hope we thank come you. back into your orbit sooner than later. Thank you thank so you much. So Thanks, much. everybody. Thank you.